Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, welcome to our fall series of book talks. Uh, I'm Carol Willis. I'm the director of the Skyscraper Museum. And uh, it's been about six weeks since our last talk, but we're ready to launch our fall autumnal um, authors talks. And we have a really wonderful book to feature tonight, um, Freedom Land, Co-op City and the Story of New York. Uh, the author, Anne-Marie Sammartino, who is uh, a professor at Oberlin College uh, a his in the Department of History, and has written this book, which is both um, a, a, a personal history, having grown up in, in, uh, in Co-op City, uh, as well as a historical study that, like the subtitle of her book places Co-op City um, housing project within not just the story of New York City, but um, within a, 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 a post-war 1960s American uh, trajectory uh, and context. Anne-Marie is a um, professor, as I said, at, at Oberlin, where she uh, teaches all sorts of, of um, urban, uh, well, European and, and I guess American history, but um, her studies and her master's and PhD at the University of Michigan were focused on Germanic studies in uh, the Weimar Republic. Uh, and her book, uh, her first book um, before this one is The Impossible Border that looks at um, migration in uh, from about 1914 through the early 1920s in Germany. And in that book, this kind of broad context of understanding the these larger forces and how, um, how groups and um, situations play out in this in a, 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 in a broad historical uh, context is an analysis that she brings um, to to the book that she called Freedom Land and you're going to find out why through her slide presentation uh, but her her um, own experience in co-op city and a kind of people oriented history that she's going to that she does bring to us in, in the book and that she will um, talk a little bit about tonight. Now I am going to um, let, let her come on the screen um, very shortly um, and let you know that you can pose your own questions as she's speaking in the chat. Um, I will leave the screen in just a moment uh, after a, a little um, uh, a connection to the Skyscraper Museum and some of this, the exhibitions and, and uh, study um, issues that we've explored in the past. Uh, but um, I'm as part of previewing the context that I'd like to ask her about afterwards, if you don't present so enough questions in order to fill the time, I will show you a few slides too. Um, and these are of an exhibition that we held at the museum about three years ago. Well, this is a view of, of Co-op City, um, as Anne-Marie points out in the introduction to her book, uh, which is, is familiar to most people only from uh, the train tracks or from the highway. And indeed, uh, guilty as charged, this is one of the slides that I took on my way to New Haven one day. Um, so this is the distant um, view of, of Co-op City. Uh, the analysis that we did in an exhibition at the museum about three years ago called Housing Density, and that was um, guest curated by the housing historian Nicholas Dagan Bloom, uh, what you can see in an installation view here. Uh, and the thing that I wanted to point out about Co-op City in the context of other housing projects, public housing projects, and also private approaches to middle-income housing um, from the 1930s through the 1960s or 70s are captured in this graphic that was in our exhibition. And as you can see, uh, you could probably recognize the names of some of the NYCHA projects. I won't go into this, this now, but uh, we may talk about it uh, later. Uh, the the density of these NYCHA projects and then other complementary projects that are part of the middle-income Mitchell-Lama uh, 
entity and organization that is is represented in the in the co-op city um, uh, example um, can be seen here. And the number of people that you see in these little squares represent the density per acre. And down in the lower right hand corner, you see co-op city, which is the least dense of any, if we call it a public housing project, not exactly the right terminology, um, of any of the projects that we analyzed in the exhibition uh, and um, certainly of any of the public housing that was built in New York from the 1930s on. Uh, its density was only 51 people per acre. And the reason that that was uh, true was because of uh, tall buildings on a small footprint with a great deal of open space around it. And density is a measure of the number of people who are consolidated in the, in the buildings and the footprint, and then the, and then the amount of open space, which in Co-op City was particularly expansive. Um, so I show you one more image in order to show you the low density of Co-op City, which I, is um, one of the questions that we may discuss in the Q&A period. So enter your questions in the chat box and I will try to consolidate them and moderate them. But let me invite Anne-Marie finally to come onto the screen now um, and I will leave you. She will also share her screen. So here is Anne-Marie San Martino. Thank you, Carol, for inviting me, and thank you um, to the rest of the staff who helped organize this. And you know, importantly, thanks to all of you who are here for this presentation. So this is the cover of the book, which you've seen already: uh, Freedom Land, Co-op City, and the Story of New York. Um, what I'm going to do today is really um, take you essentially through an outline um, of the narrative of the book. Um, I'm certainly happy to answer any questions in the Q&A. Um, you know, afterwards, also, I'm really easy to find. Otherwise, send me an email if we don't get to your question. Um, be happy to talk to you more. So, um, Co-op City is a city of superiors. It is the largest Mitchell Lama development in New York State. It was funded by New York State. Indeed, 15% of New York State Mitchell Lama housing is, is Co-op City. Um, its mortgage of $390 million was the largest mortgage ever issued by the New York State Housing Finance Agency. It is currently the largest naturally occurring retirement community or NORC in the United States. But I'll add a couple more at more esoteric statistics. Um, if laid end to end, the piling, so Co-op City is built on swampland and it's the towers are built on these like huge pilings um, that run down um, under the swamp. Um, if they were laid end to end, they could go all the way to Boston and back again. The bathroom tile used to construct Co-op City could construct a wall five, five feet high all the way from New York to St. Louis. I could keep going, but you, you get the picture. In any event, Co-op City is large, and yet at the same time, it has largely escaped the gaze of historians. Um, and I have some suspicions about why, um, which I'll discuss in the book and could talk about here if people are interested. But for now, I just want to note its peculiar absence from the historiography. Um, I do want to quickly also note that, you know, as, as the title of the, the book, so this is Co-op City here, first of all, you can see it's sort of Northeast Bronx, there's a kind of view of it. Um, you know, the subtitle of the book is, is Co-op City and the Story of New York. And by Story of New York, I really mean two things. On a sort of general level, the Story of New York I'm talking about is a story that is often told from the center, like, you know, both the geographical center, namely Manhattan, um, but also from the sort of centers of power. Um, and, you know, whether consciously or unconsciously reproduce that gaze. Um, Co-op City is on the literal and in some ways figurative margins of the city. And so I think this, the, the narrative you tell from that perspective looks quite a bit different. In particular, though, the other piece of this is one, one of the sort of broader narratives, and everyone here who is an urban historian will both know what I'm talking about and also know the ways I'm simplifying it. Um, but broadly speaking, you know, is this idea that New York is this kind of work in some ways like almost social democratic city um, in the post-war period. And then that, um, you know, with, with things like subsidized housing, not just for the very poor, with free universities, hospitals, et cetera. And that that comes almost to a screeching halt with the bankruptcy of 75, um, and or the near bankruptcy rather of 75. 
And then um, with the sort of neoliberal era that, um, you know, that that comes afterwards. And one thing that I talk about in the book is the ways in which the story of co-op city kind of disrupts that narrative on a number of different levels. Um, but to understand that, I think it's worth, let's start talking about the, the history that I'm narrating. So this is actually a picture from Co-op City's 50th anniversary gala, which was a few years ago. Um, and at this gala, um, Co-op City was celebrated. Um, Mayor Bill de Blasio congratulated Co-op City as, quote, a vibrant and inclusive complex and a, quote, vital ally in my administration's efforts to expand access to affordable housing. Brooklyn or Bronx Borough President Ruben Diaz described it as, quote, one of the city's true gems. And what they're pointing to, in some sense, is the fact that Co-op City, as resident after resident told me in interviews, remains a really good deal, even as the rest of New York has become increasingly unaffordable with median apartment prices um, to purchase in Manhattan well over a million dollars, with median rents in Manhattan well over $4,000 a month. Um, Co-op City is a lot cheaper. My, my mother still lives in Co-op City in the same uh, three-bedroom apartment that I grew up in, and she pays less than $1,700 a month, and that includes utilities. Um, for, and this is in a three-bedroom apartment with hardwood floors, large bedrooms and closets, air conditioning, etc. But the celebration of Co-op City is in some ways somewhat new. Um, here's just a sampling of quotes that are less laudatory. And these are just, I kind of you know, picked these slightly at random, but not entirely. Um, and they show us a few different ways in which these critiques about Co-op City have developed. One is the idea that Co-op City was kind of architecturally banal or ugly, in fact. Um, secondly, the idea that Co-op City was financially irresponsible as a construction project and that its residents were financially unrealistic. Third, and the argument that Co-op City was a fundamentally racist project that contributed to the decline of the Bronx in the 60s and 70s. As I discuss in the book, all three of these critiques don't come from nowhere. I mean, there's some basis that you could use to talk about any of them. And yet at the same time, they don't tell the entire story. But in this talk, I come neither really to bury Co-op City nor to praise it. Rather, what I'd like to do is just provide an outline of the narrative of the book, which is really an outline of the narrative of Co-op City's first 25 year, uh, really its construction and then and including the first 25 years then of its occupancy. Okay, this is a picture of the ceremonial groundbreaking at Co-op City, and I, I, this is from 1966. Actual ground had been broken um, in 65, but this image is interesting um, for a couple of things. Uh, first of all, this is built by the United Housing Foundation, which is a um, uh, had constructed kind of a long line of um, affordable housing development, starting with Penn South through the project right before Co-op City, Rochdale Village in Queens, which is the next largest project at 5,000 apartments, but even that puts it at really a third of the size of Co-op City. Um, but in a, so the United Housing Foundation is this kind of curious beast as an organization. On the one hand, these are dreamers. These are people that believe that are committed to the idea of cooperative housing as a means to prize, provide stability. And in their more officials, more rhapsodic moments, a sense of uplift and grandeur to um, people of moderate means who otherwise would be suffering at the hands of predatory um, landlords. The United Housing Foundation is founded in 1951 um, and then will mostly take advantage of Mitchell Lama funding, which um, Dr. Willis mentioned earlier, in order to construct its, its development. You'll also notice here a few other people that may be familiar, including um, Governor Rockefeller, and um, he's uh, smiling in the middle. And then also, if you look at the children that are here, you'll note that it's a sort of almost like like it is literally a very purposefully multicultural group of children. There's like two black children, which um, in particular, um, and we'll talk about why that's significant um, a little bit later. Um, so from the first, the United Housing Foundation or UHF was interested in creating a kind of community in Co-op City. They believed that residents required a kind of training to develop the appropriate forms of cooperative behavior in order to create the kind of community that they prized. Orientation meetings like this, handbooks, other sorts of things were designed to sort of 
teach people to engage with each other appropriately with this idea that by living together and, and working cooperatively, they could not only safeguard their housing. So this is limited equity housing. So essentially everyone that buys an apartment, so what they do is they pay with an equity deposit, which at first is $450 per room, and then they pay carrying charges though per month and those carrying charges cover the mortgage and um, as well as operating expenses and but the united housing foundation is interested in this model both because it promised they see it as cheaper but also because they believe it gives um, residents a sense of ownership in the the community um, and indeed, they believe they were created. One of the appeals of Co-op City, in fact, is in the name itself, right? It's a cooperative, it's been designed to be a cooperative city. And in some ways, almost because of its scale, big enough that it could have, um, you know, an entire kind of cooperative world. So for example, Jacob Potofsky, the president of Amalgamated Bank, which worked closely with UHF, in fact, Potofsky is on the board of the United Housing Foundation, explained um, once, quote, that residents of Co-op City should buy in our cooperative food stores. A resident will buy his furniture in a cooperative furniture store. He buys his cosmetics and drugs in a cooperative drug store. He opens his account in the Amalgamated Bank, which is union owned. We even have our own insurance company and I could you know go on about this right but the United Housing Foundation was also invested in a community that was simultaneously diverse and homogenous what I mean by that is that they are invested in having a racially diverse community and that's um you know as I said that's one of the things that's sort of indicative or interesting about that initial groundbreaking image right um, they, UHF officials repeatedly stressed that Co-op City was an open city and there were no explicit restrictions against non-white families moving in. Um, now, I'll talk a little bit later about what the racial dynamics of Co-op City actually wind up being, but at least explicitly they're devoted to this, um, this idea. The UHF also is interested in generational diversity. In fact, they proactively sought out younger residents because they could see that the development, and you can see that's the ad here, it's a young family's world. There's other ads like that, but that's that's kind of the most famous one, I think. I don't know if any of these are famous, but whatever. In any event, um, they could already see that the development was attractive to the elderly from the very beginning. Um, and I can talk about why that might've been later on, um, but, uh, but their goal was a generationally diverse community. The one place where they are pretty um, insistent on homogeneity was in terms of class. Co-op city apartments, as I said, were open to anybody provided they could pay that 450 room equity deposit to enter the cooperative and also meet Mitchell Lama income guidelines um, that mandated that anyone who moved in could not earn more than seven times the carrying charges in a co-op city apartment, which in 1965 was originally projected at around $22 a room. So, um, the city pushed, in fact, to get rid of the equity deposit with and make these and, and, and reserve several apartment or some section of apartments as um, pure rentals. And the city refused the or the United UHF refused to do this. They were less interested in some ways in affordable housing per se than in creating a cooperative um, cooperative affordable housing in which ownership was kind of the bedrock cooperative ownership was the bedrock of their that community. Now, the city also pushed to have Co-op City advertised more widely, um, in part because um, UHF developments in general, um, reflecting in some ways the um, backgrounds of the founders of the organization, tended to um, attract a, a Jewish and labor-oriented clientele. So basically, you know, your average Co-op City resident indeed would be a sort of um, unionized um, Jewish worker. Um, and so basically to avoid it being completely homogenous or this fear that it could be completely homogenous, the city pushes the UHF to advertise in the black press and the Spanish speaking press, which they do. And they do, you know, actually relatively willingly. They don't have, in other words, at least at the outset, a problem with, with racial diversity per se, but merely with bending economic rules to make that happen. So Co-op City's first residence would um, move in in December of 1968, and it was um, fully constructed and occupied by the end of 72. Now in all five, so it's divided into five sections, you can see here on this um, site plan from 69, which is doesn't include, the, the biggest thing it doesn't include here is um, what later on would be the Bay Plaza Mall, but that doesn't get constructed really until the late 80s, so that's why it's not here. <laughs> 
In any event, in all five sections, um, both the high rise buildings and the and then these uh, seven ta um, townhouse clusters, which were um, the city mandated that they include those. It was a new thing for um, the UHF to include, um, led directly into cul-de-sac interior streets. Um, there are also plenty of paths that are not on streets at all. Um, it's a development that's actually quite easily walkable. Um, and it could be disorienting for many visitors and new residents who found themselves surrounded and still find themselves, if you go to Co-op City, you may see this, surrounded by seemingly identical tower and slab buildings. To provide a sense of orientation, the street names for each of the five sections began with a different letter. So section one, for some reason, section one begins with D, section two with C, three with A, and four with B. I don't know, it, the, and then five with E. But the names of each of the streets are somewhat aspirational. I'm just going to list the ones for section, some of the ones for section one, just to give you a sense of what I'm talking about. So in section one, there's Debs Place for the socialist politician Eugene Debs, De Kroof Place for the scientist, Defoe Place for the author, Darrow Place for the lawyer, and Donizetti Place for the composer. These names displayed the values of the UHF in some ways. They were aspirational, and while they were largely but not exclusively American, they were otherwise unconnected to any single place or history. Insofar as the very definition of utopia is derived from the Greek word for no place, these names were utopian, right? They conveyed the UHF belief that the cooperative stood for progress, scientific, social, cultural, and political. Now, as um, uh, Dr. Willis mentioned earlier, Co-op City's apartment buildings only occupied 15% of the land area of the development. The rest of the space, some of it was de um, devoted to a variety of establishments, such as three community centers, um, which for featured a variety of goods and services for residents, including both commercial and non-commercial spaces, such as cooperative supermarkets, pharmacies, an optical store, also cooperative and amalgamated bank, a credit union, kosher bushers and delis, some other restaurants, et cetera, et cetera. There was a branch of the New York Public Library, um, as well. And then each of the community centers had 50 rooms for community meetings, which were leased to clubs, educational groups, and voluntary associations, as well as, um, at least at the beginning, for religious communities. Um, the high-rise towers themselves also provided community facilities, including a cooperative nursery, school located off the lobby of Building 15, and rooms for a variety of medical offices, just in regular, actually just some regular apartments or actually medical offices. The development had its own fire station. It had eight six-story garages. Um, and although it would not fully open until 1974, there was an educational park with two elementary schools, two intermediate schools and a high school, um, as well as an additional elementary school um, located in section five, which is, so this is the educational park here, and then the additional elementary school is there. Um, and then there's also um, in this center area, it's sort of hard to see on this map, but in reality, most of this space here is green space. There's a huge open green space in the middle and then lots of like smaller kind of parks with um, like uh, sand, you know, like, um, like children's playgrounds and stuff strewn throughout the development otherwise. Now, the UHF refu officially re did not publish demographic statistics about the residents of Co-op City. However, it's possible to piece together some information from the people who initially moved in. Um, throughout the, the, the period between Co-op City's initial proposal and its initial occupancy, the UHF, as I mentioned before, it fought to keep the development middle, what they saw as middle class, um, which in reality is a kind of lower middle class through um, like working class. In fact, um, the uh, um, essentially the the incomes of people in co-ops, at least according to census statistics, have been roughly the same as the um, in, as national median and New York City median incomes through um, 2010. And I talk about that a little bit, or there's a chart about that a little bit in the book. Um, and um, indeed, in 1970, the mean total income of co-op city residents was $8,325. The median was um, uh, 8,500, which is really almost identical to that of the city. And, um, and actually for the moment, the borough, the, the Bronx will lose income in comparison soon. Um, 
65 percent of families had an income between five and ten thousand and over 80 percent had a total in household income between three thousand and twelve thousand um, the majority of those at the bottom of the income bracket were retirees who are eligible to receive a subsidy um, allocated from the surcharges so if people earn too much they lived in Co-op City, but their income was over that threshold, they would then, um, this is Mitchell Lama regulations, they would pay a surcharge and that was supposed to help um, those at the bottom. The most common professions included office workers, uh, state and city employees, pharmacists, garment workers, and accountants. Um, upwards of six of 70% um, um, of Co-op City's initial residents were Jewish. Co-op City's Jewish population puts it alone within the ranks of some of the largest Jewish cities in the United States and indeed the world. In the early 70s, there were only 12 cities in the United States that had more Jews than Co-op City alone. Um, in fact, Co-op City on its own would have been one of the top 25 Jewish cities in the entire world, which is pretty impressive, really. Um, while Co-op City's Jewish population was double that of, the, of um, the percentage of Jews in the Bronx, the development itself actually was not entirely the, the white Jewish enclave that um, some city officials and others had feared. Although section one was almost entirely Jewish, the first one that was occupied um, and made up of some of the first people to submit applications, as word spread, Co-op City's applicant pool would become more diverse. In 1968, um, Harold Ostroff, who had become the um, president of, of the River Bay, which is the corporation that runs Co-op City, he's from the United Housing Foundation, he would boast that they had um, over 20% non-white applicants. and. Um, the later sections to be built would have increasingly large percentage of black and Latino access, uh, um, applicants and then residents. By the time Co-op City opened, between 20 and 25 percent of residents were either black or Latino, and those who were Latino were mostly Puerto Rican. Later on, um, there'll be a Dominican population in Co-op City. That's usually we're talking about 80s and onward. Um, according to census statistics, New York City in 1970, um, was about 76.6% uh, white, well, and the white non-Hispanic population was estimated around 64%. And in, so in the end, Co-op City was a little bit more white than the city as a whole, but not a huge amount more white. Um, and those Black and Latino residents were drawn from the same middle class demographics as their white neighbors. Um, and they all shared roughly the same reasons for moving to Co-op City um, as the future Supreme, or actually um, Sonia Sotomayor lived in Co-op City as um, a teenager. And um, she would talk about her family's reasons for moving there in 1970. And she said, quote, my mother was eager to get us into a safer place because the Bronxdale projects where there her family had lived was headed downhill fast and home was starting to look like a war zone. Similar stories you can hear from um, basically almost every single person I talk to. Um, new residents exulted in their apartments. Um, one, uh, Ann Hershkovitz recalled, quote, I never remember being so excited about anything. We hadn't seen the apartment until we walked in and we ran around exploring every nook and corner of the beautiful six room apartment. Although Co-op City's residents were drawn almost exclusively from the left of the political spectrum, this would be actually one of the um, largest uh, democratic voting blocks in New York City. Um, really, it's for it still is in some ways, but certainly in this these early years. Um, uh, but nevertheless, the um, most of the people who moved in were more impact, uh, attracted to the creature comforts and safety of the development rather than the ideological appeal of the UHF cooperative vision. The UHF was largely undisturbed by this because they believed that um, Co-op City was um, that uh, you know, was evidence of a kind of cooperative dream come true. Um, one official exulted, quote, after nearly three years of meetings with thousands of applicants, I suddenly walk into a thriving, thro a living, throbbing beehive of humanity. Grandparents relaxing on benches, young mothers shushing baby carriages and oceans um, of children in and out of camp scattered in every cool nook and cranny playing happily in the vast and as yet uncultivated good earth 
completely unconscious of color or any other adult-oriented distinctions that are the bane of our society everywhere except in co-op communities. So that's, you know, getting again at this kind of, um, also this kind of co-op, like this UHF ethos of um, kind of multicultural but kind of colorblind community, which in some ways is problematic as we can talk about, but also is, is very important to a lot of these residents and the UHF. Optimism about co-op city's future was shared by residents, which served to allow the community to weather generational stresses and also some racial ones in those early years. And these were often intertwined actually because younger families were more likely to be diverse for a number of reasons I can talk about in the comments. And the relative class homogeneity may also have helped build a community as Reggie, one black uh, resident uh, who was interviewed by a sociologist said, um, quote, I didn't know anyone who was on welfare or Section 8. Everyone seemed to be working hard and instilling a value in their kids. Everyone was seeking a utopia. We were all haves and not have nots. But there was one tension that good feelings could not overcome. And that is financial turmoil. This I love this image because this is actually a co-op. So the Co-op City Times has this as like a promotional image promotional photo, but if you look at what's the, the, the um, cover, the this is the Cub City Times is the, um, uh, it's the, the sort of house org, it's like owned by UHF, at least in these early years and expresses kind of their line on things. But even then, if you look at the title here or the one of the headlines is that the AC, which refers to the advisory councils, discusses increases, searches for solution, talking about the increases in carrying charges that really accompany um, co-op cities um, early occupancy really from the very beginning. Carrying charges would increase in 1970. So these are the resident charges, 71, 73, and 74. And then there was an additional 25% increase planned for mid 75 that would trigger a rent strike, which I'll, I'll talk about in a bit. Costs, if had that go, gone through in 75, the proposed um, increase would have been 250% of the originally promised $22 a room. So, you know, quite a large increase. And the reasons for those increases really stem from a number of factors I want to just very briefly mention, and we can certainly come back if people are interested later on. One of them is just general inflation. Um, we all know a little bit about that right now, I think. Um, secondly, um, rising interest rates during this period, actually also something we know about today. Um, you know, originally the, the bonds, um, so Co-op City is built by essentially the State Housing Finance Agency would borrow money and then use that and, and they would basically use their ability to get lower interest rates than the private market to have these low rate bonds and then the, that those are the bonds that subsidize that basically pay for the that's those bonds are the mortgage um that uh for co-op city and the rates would rise quite a, like um, up to two percentage points above what they'd originally been projected at there were also artificially low estimates of um, uh, how much co-op city would cost. There were, um, and so some of the increase was almost like baked in as a result of that. There were sped up timelines, which then would re um, lead to work that needed to be redone. And I'll talk a little bit later about it would also lead to infrastructure problems. Um, and finally, there's some degree of corruption. Now, you know, corruption is one of those tricky things. It's hard to kind of pinned down exactly because people tend not to put in our in records like and here's exactly where we were corrupt but it's clear that there is some corruption and corruption was indeed endemic in um, Mitchell Lama housing um, whether it was this nonprofit version or or the for-profit version um, like uh, Trump Tower the father of the current president you know his developments um, in Trump Village rather in Queens okay so um as costs would go up, the UHF and residents were both appalled by these rises, and the um, but um, and the UHF sought every means in their power. Um, they were kind of panicked about it to try and bring costs down, and that's something I talk about quite a bit in the in the book. On the other hand, the United Housing Foundation was used to working with New York State. 
They were used to working with them. That's how they had constructed all this housing, right? They were reliant on New York State money. So while they lobbied for um, relief for residents for these uh, carrying charge increases, there was a limit um, of how much they were really going to advocate. They believed that residents ultimately would need to pay these increases. Residents did not accept that. They felt they had been hoodwinked, that duped into buying affordable development that was no longer affordable. By 1974, activism around carrying charge increases dominated local politics and increasingly took the form of demands for a rent strike. Now, a rent strike was nothing new or anything invented by co-op city residents. It had actually arisen as a tactic um, in the same Lower East Side tenements that were really the birthplace of the United Housing Foundation. Um, however, um, and, and continued to be a tactic used really throughout the 20th century. Um, however, there's an interesting thing about Co-op City's rent strike, which is that it wasn't a rent strike at all, because on the one hand, it, it was um, the people that lived there were not technically renters. They were paying, they were part owners, right? They were paying these carrying charges, not rent. By calling it a rent strike, it's actually a provocation. It's a way of saying, essentially, you know, we, demand that we be allowed that that like we're saying we're being treated like tenants right and um so the leader of the rent strike is this man here in the middle um charles rosen who's a young union printer um and the rent strike might well have happened without rosen residents have been talking about this for years but he was incredible forceful personality he was an experienced organizer and the nature of his critique as i'll say as well also played a role in his popularity um he um you know assumed control of um sc3 which is the organization that runs the rent strikes the abbreviation for steering committee three anyway he assumes control at the age of 31 and he was a generation younger than most of the leaders of co-op city politics Rosen was the son of immigrant Jews who had become um, and the, who had become communist activists during the Depression. And Rosen was a true believer. He'd visited the Soviet Union. He'd met with Khrushchev in the early 60s. He'd switched his affiliation to the Maoist Progressive Labor Party, where um, he met his his wife, Lynn. Um, when I visited um, Charlie uh, a number of years ago, he gave me, you know, I, I, I mentioned that I'm an, uh, a German or um, Professor uh, Willis mentioned this, that I'm a German historian by training. He gave me a uh, um, East German uh, publication, like from, you know, sort of communist publication with like all this like statistics in it. Um, in any event, he had taken a step back from activism. He became a union printer working at the New York Post. And in 1970, he and his wife moved to Co-op City because like so many other residents, they wanted stable rents and a decent integrated environment to raise their young children. Um, but once in Co-op City, he first became the chairman of the Building 22 Association, the building that he lived in, um, and then uh, ultimately the leader of SC3. Rosen brought his experience and perspective from years of left-wing organizing. Um, and most of the people that lived in Co-op City were really undeterred by his, um, uh, you know, his leftism, as one would later recall, we all knew he was sympathetic to the Chinese and Soviets, and maybe that was part of his allure. Rosen was charismatic, and he drew people to his vision of this powerful organization led by residents to represent residents that would combat what he saw as a dangerous alliance between the state, the United Housing Foundation, and the banks that were oppressing co-op city and middle-class men and women across America. Um, his Marxism was really central to his understanding of why the rent strike had happened and why it needed and how it would be won. Um, he saw the, the true enemy of Co-op City as this nexus of government and financial power represented by the Housing Finance Agency. Um, the reason, he argued, why Co-op City faced carrying charge increase after carrying charge increase was that the state government cared more about satisfying its bondholders than its citizens. Um, now, the rent strike started in 75 and lasted in um, June of 75 and lasted until July of 76. Over 75% um, of residents took part um, withholding checks from the state. As soon as the rent strike started, the UHF's board would resign. And while it would continue to exist for a little while longer, it would never build new housing again. Um, 
Now, um, you know, what would happen is this was happening, by the way, at the same time as New York City, if you think about the chronology, is experiencing its own near bankruptcy. And in the Q&A, if people are interested, I'm happy to talk a little bit about um, uh, about some of the connections between the city's bankruptcy and that near bankruptcy and that the near bankruptcy of the state housing finance agency. Um, but essentially, co-op cities um, $390 million mortgage represented over a third of the housing finance agency's entire portfolio of bonds. So with residents not paying carrying charges, it led to this constant scramble on the part of the state to cover the shortfall. Um, in the end, the state would capitulate with the end of the rent strike coming in July of 76, 13 long months after it had began, uh, begun. Um, you know, there was all this like excitement, right? This was a successful rent strike. Residents had earned control of the development. As one would say, um, we now are Bienvenida Quintana, one resident said, quote, at least our community now has an opportunity to find out by itself. Um, if the increases the state wanted were legitimate. Um, the end of the rent strike, though, would not bring the utopia that many had hoped for. Unable to find enough savings or new income, new resident directors would be forced to approve carrying charge increases in, 70, in 1977, an anonymous end to a rent strike with the slogan, no way we won't pay, which you see in the image here. The state was generally unwilling to negotiate further, and with Cobb City and resident hands who were loath to carry out another rent strike, they didn't really have to. The state would force through additional carrying increases in the late 1970s and early 80s. Meanwhile, during this period, Cobb City would become an increasingly diverse community. By 1976, when the rent strike ended, Co-op City's apartment wait list would be 90% Black and Hispanic, and the community's demographics would slowly change. By 1980, Black and white um, residents in the Co-op Co City were largely equal. Um, uh, and, you know, this image can tell you a little bit about that. So this is an Aldridge nursery class photo from 1980. Um, I, I'm in this picture. Um, that's that's me. Um, but you can see that, you know, if you look at this, the, the racial demographics here, one thing that was noteworthy is that it was the younger demographics that changed more quickly than the older um, ones. Um, and there are a number of reasons about that for that I can talk about later. Um, as, as Co-op City's demographics began to change, other things began to change too. One was the discovery of significant construction defects in the 1980s. And in the 1980s, we see this story of crumbling infrastructure as well as rising crime or fears of rising crime. Now, the construction defects had been found as early as the early 70s. Um, in fact, one room in the high school could only be used as a greenhouse because it was so hot and humid all the time. Um, but became increasingly problematic in the 80s. In fact, it was discovered the entire plumbing system needed to be replaced. Meanwhile, crime began to rise as well in the 80s. Statistical evidence confirms that Co-op City had become more dangerous. Um, Co-op City accounted for about 56% of the 45th precinct. And um, in 1990, um, there were um, 4,727 major crimes in that precinct. Its two neighboring precincts had six and 7,000 respectively. In other words, Co-op City was still, the crime rate was still lower than its neighbors, but it had had the lowest crime rate in the city when it was first founded. Um, and this rise in crime was a, a crisis, but in some ways it was less important than the fears of higher crime. From its inception, Co-op City had been defined by a certain paradox. On the one hand, residents celebrated the community's racial integration, but on the other, racially inflected fears about crime and neighborhood decline were always a part of the community from its first days. Neither of these things changed as Co-op City became a majority non-white community in the 1980s. Indeed, while Co-op City experienced a racial transition in those years, um, the basic anxiety that neighborhood deterioration was an ever-present threat and the usually unspoken assumption that such deterioration was caused by the growth of the neighborhood's Black population was an unfortunate continuity. Calls for a greater police presence were the flip side of celebrations of racial harmony in Co-op City, in both cases motivated by the anxiety of whether a, black co a, a majority Black Co-op City could retain its character as an integrated middle-class community. 
Now, while co-op cities' anxieties about crime were inexplicably, inescapably connected with racism, fears about crime and calls for vigorous efforts to combat it were not limited to white residents. Um, black politicians were equally vociferous in articulating their fears and demanding police protection as their white neighbors. Um, in fact, yet at the same time, um, by actually, I'll, I'll leave that, come back to that in a second. As a result of both the sense that the neighborhood was becoming less safe and the construction issues, that it was literally falling apart. By the early 1990s, Co-op City would face a serious vacancy crisis. By 1993, 1,500, so about 10% of the development, um, 1,500 apartments stood empty. Co-op City's vacancy problem was an existential crisis, no less serious than the one caused by rising in carrying charges two decades earlier. Um, and part of what's going on is that Co-op City was caught in this period where home ownership like, um, was still potentially affordable and it was increasingly attractive to people co-ops like new york city in general was becoming um uh you know like housing prices had stabilized and begun to rise but they were not no less not yet unaffordable entirely in fact um one uh commissioner of the uh department of housing and community rule renewal that sort of managed co-op uh, oversaw Mitchell Lama said, quote, in the early 1990s, the average equity deposit was um, is, is 14,000 and families with that prefer to use it as a down payment. It's a struggle for co-op city. Now, th but what's interesting is that through the late 80s, the state and city became increasingly conciliatory in their dealings with co-op city. Part of this was due to a greater pragmatism. Mario Cuomo, the, mayor, the governor of New York, prided himself on not being dogmatic and trying different approaches to get affordable housing. Some of this was the fact that both city and the state were on a firmer financial footing than they had been a decade earlier. And part was the fact that as New York became increasingly unaffordable, affordable housing like Co-op City began to seem more precious. And finally, the fear of the rent strike continued to kind of hang over officials' heads as um, you know, reason to negotiate. In 1992, River Bay and the state would slash the per room equity deposit. Um, as well as arrange for full financing of it so that res uh, to open up the development to a wider range of residents. In doing so, they tacitly admitted that Co-op City was competing with renters and not for people who could otherwise choose their own homes. And they also began to ag um, advertise aggressively for new residents, as in this ad and many others from the, the early and mid 90s. Um, you know, ads would brag that, you know, this was the world's largest housing cooperative and also quite literally the biggest housing bargain in town. Um, they would offer credits for the first month's carrying charges, as well as um, housewarming gift certificates towards the purchase of new appliances. By 1995, Co-op City had arrested the rise of vacancies. Um, and in fact, they'd begun to go down to the lowest number in a decade. Um, now, since that time, Co-op City's carrying charges have barely kept up with inflation, and it has become again, albeit in a transformed guise, the integrated affordable community that its original founders had promoted. And so really what we um, are watching here is this story of Co-op City um, go enduring these multiple crises, and then ultimately as um, one of the children holding a shovel in that initial image would say, um, he moved into Co-op City and was still, is still living there um, at the 50th anniversary celebration, he would say, quote, here we are a half century later and Co-op City is still standing. This milestone squashes rumors of our impermanence. We have not sunk into the marsh once home to freedom land. We're still standing. Thank you. That was a wonderful presentation. Thank you so Thank much. You. Um, uh, much to talk about and only t about 10 minutes remaining. Um, I have to say that we um, are technically we kind of succeeded in getting questions, but only up into the office and not to me down here in the okay. room. And <laughs> communicated to me um, in an email. And uh, um, I think you've already asked 
uh, answered a couple of them in sure. the remainder of your presentation. Uh, one was, and, and a lot of this had to do with your personal experience. Uh, one sure. is, is about crime, which I think you, uh, and mm -hmm. shifts, which you addressed. Uh, and somebody wants to know, did you go to the, um, all of the co-op city schools, which I think. <laughs> no, I did. So I was part of a program in district. So I went through public schools my entire, you know, childhood and adolescence. I, um, went to PS 83, which is, um, a school not in co-op city itself, but was part of this program called the EG program, which was for kids from across the district. I went to middle school, um, in co-op city at IS 181. Um, and then I went to high school at, um, uh, Oh, I just saw there's someone from the EG program who's actually here. So hi, Jane. <laughs> um, uh, and then I went to Hunter High School um, for high school. So, um, you know, somewhat a product of Co-op City. And I also, of course, went to nursery school in Co-op City. So. Well, those schools should boast you as an <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Um, you didn't tell us uh, very much about the the site and um, and the role of Robert Moses, which someone mm -hmm. was asking us about because uh, mm -hmm. Leonard um, Steinbeck says conceptually, I've always linked Co-op City and the Cross Bronx Expressway um, mm -hmm. in the development of the Bronx in the sixties and seventies. Is there a relationship, and and if so, how would you define it? So Robert Moses was um, actually in some ways involved in the transfer of land to Co-op City. So before Co-op City occupies the site, it's um, the United um, Housing Foundation gets it from what had once been this, the Freedom Land Amusement Park. That's the reason for the title. Um, and uh, so that goes bankrupt. And um, although there's people who believe, like there's sort of conspiracy, I, I don't want to get into what happens, but essentially the land reverts the Teamsters and it's and then it goes to the United Housing Foundation. And in some ways, um, later on, members of the United Housing Foundation will refer to Moses as, quote unquote, the marriage broker that allowed the deal to come together. However, at this time, you know, Moses is really, you know, starting to lose. He is engaged in a power struggle with um, with Rockefeller. He's starting to lose his um, authority and he's not really involved, um, nearly as involved in the construction or anything. And he also in you know, uh, of Co-op City as um, he was in some earlier developments. He does speak at the, um, uh, um, he attends and then does speak at the um, ceremonial groundbreaking that I, I showed the image from. And the speech is, is is sort of classic Moses, but this isn't, he's not a huge part of the, the actual story. Mm -hmm. uh, and another follow-up question or similar to that, um, you noted the first high-rise cluster was largely Jewish. When when vacancies occurred, was there a policy to try to integrate it? Um, if not, why not? There was not an official policy to integrate individual buildings. That said, I do want to talk about like sort of for the cooperative as a whole, one of the sort of cri or like really controversies of the early years is that um, so essentially one thing that so Co-op City has this it it's you know technically shareholder run but the the board of directors before um 1975 before the rent strike is really largely people from uhf um from the united housing foundation itself right but they have this resident advisory council now the resident advisory council is voted on by the residents and there was members from each building well while the and and what that resulted in was an advisory council in, from the first elections that was entirely white and Jewish, and um, then there was pushback from people who were essentially not white and Jewish, um, and the United Housing Foundation then instituted what they would call the minority clause, which basically said that of the residents from a building, the one of the, I think it's four res I I need to check these numbers, but I believe it's four four three or four. Um, representatives from each building that 
one would have to be, or maybe it's like a third of the overall population. I, I have to check this, but it's in the book if anyone really is interested. Um, they would um, have to be not white or Jewish. So it was interesting. It was actually, they, they like, so even you could be white and count as a minority as long as you weren't Jewish because of the overwhelmingly Jewish nature of the cooperative. And so there is in that way an attempt to um, provide uh, some sense of integration in the governance structure. And also there is attention paid at various points to, um, you know, like, are people like, is this building getting, you know, better integrated than that building or whatever, but there's no proactive attempt in the 70s to increase or sort of play with the racial demographics of individual buildings. I want to fast forward, though, and mention one sort of quick follow up to that, which is that, as I mentioned, by 1976, the develop the wait list is 90% black and um, Hispanic. Um, and for a time, the the new resident managers, they actually want to put in this rule, it's, I think it's called Resolution 131, which the idea behind I mean, 130, again, I'm forgetting the exact one, but again, I check it, but essentially saying that there would be priority for people that um, were relatives of current residents. What that would have done had it gone through um, is is um, prioritize white people on the wait list, in particular Jews on the wait, because that's the majority of who was living there at that point, right? Um, and then the um, there would be complaints from the Urban League, um, uh, from open housing groups, and complaints from within the community, and they would withdraw that. And that and that would actually not go through. And there's a sort of different controversy also related to the wait list from the 1980s that I talk about in some detail in the book. Mm -hmm. Uh, maybe in our last remaining about four or five mm -hmm. minutes, um, we could return to the question that I raised mm -hmm. uh, about density and yeah. space. Uh, and mm -hmm. you could speak from your personal history about sure. how you felt about the concentration of people in those buildings, which is very urban, mm -hmm. but the amount, the kind of well of, of surrounding space and, and whether it was well utilized or not, or was did right. the automobile privileged in a way that in so many, many places yeah. took over the amen mm -hmm. urban amenities that we should, we deserve instead? Yeah, no, it's a great question. And um, uh, briefly, I do want to say a number of people put some questions in the chat as direct messages to me. I don't think I'm going to have time to answer them now, but I'm very easy to find online. You just email me. I'm really happy to answer any of these questions or, you know, talk more. Um, but to this question of density, so the thing that's interesting about Co-op City is that, you know, once you're inside it, it does not feel like that dense of a community. Part of that is because the density is concentrated, as, as you noted, in these towers, these buildings with a relatively small footprint. So if you're in the building, there'd be a concentration of people in the lobbies or right around buildings or um, but not. But there's also a lot of open space. And that open space was really a priority for a lot of residents. These are people who are coming largely from, you know, I, from neighborhoods that were themselves quite dense. Some of a, a fair percentage, I don't know the exact numbers, but a fair number are coming from um, and um, NYSHA housing projects. A fair number are coming from like sort of densely packed, you know, from like these kind of smaller, almost like tenement buildings around the Grand Concourse. So some are living in the grand building. Mostly they're not. They're living in the small streets nearby. And so they prized the kind of wide open spaces. But there was a lot of conflict about how to use those spaces. On the one hand, you have children and teenagers, and I remember this as a child, I hated this, you know, who wanted to be able to play on these open spaces. And then you had basically old people sitting in um, folding chairs who did not want you to do that. Um, and that's kind of a perennial conflict. Um, in a lot of spaces, but it's but what's interesting here is very different values on how to think about that open space, even if it's sort of prized more generally. By the time I was growing up, and certainly as a you know teenager, there was so much um, construction in Co-op City that the, a lot of the open spaces were just construction zones again. Um, this was about, as I mentioned before, it's the um, the fact that there's all of this. Um, uh, infrastructure problems. I mean, they're digging up the whole, as I mentioned, the whole plumbing system. At one point, they have to replace all the garage, like do major construction work on all the garages, stuff like that. And so at that point, it didn't really feel like open space. It felt like living in this like eternal construction zone of mud. 
Um, you know, the one other thing you mentioned was cars. Now, Co-op City is in a two fare zone to get to Manhattan. Um, there are some buses that will take you to other parts of the Bronx, but it's hard. I mean, you can walk out of Co-op City. It's just not a pleasant walk. Um, it's not designed for people to, to walk really out of it. Um, and so most residents own cars. Um, there are, um, you know, uh, although my parents didn't for most of the time I was growing up, um, there are like these eight garages, you know, the, 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 the space is designed in some ways for automobile traffic. On the other hand, there are all of these internal pedestrian walkways. Um, you know, it feels like there's a lot you can do without actually encountering a car. It's also, this is one of the reasons in part why it's retained its status as a Newark, as a naturally occurring retirement community. As mentioned, my mother lives there with my, with my sister um, still, and my father lived there until he died. And he, um, you know, until shortly before he died, would just walk to the grocery store as an 86 year old man. That's something that does feel very urban. And in some ways, like Co-op City feels like a car oriented place if your reference point is a certain other New York neighborhoods. But as someone who now lives in the mid Midwest, it feels like very much like a pedestrian's paradise. <laughs> well, uh I guess um, this may be an un unfair question or maybe just particular to you, but um, do you, when you say, I suppose in the Midwest, you say I'm, I, I, I came from New York or I was born mm. in New York City, but um, do, do people in New York in co-op city generally think of themselves as people of the Bronx or mm. the people of New York? That's an interesting question. So, you know, one linguistically, right, a lot of people in co-op will talk about, oh, I'm going down to the city like a sort of parlance. And there's some people who live in Co-op City who very much think of themselves as residents of the Bronx. I didn't ever really, even though I lived in the Bronx at the time I was a very small child, like I don't remember living anywhere else. And I think that was partially because I went to high school in Manhattan. It was partially because I, you know, I, I think my mother really like wanted to, like when I was a very small child would take me you take an express bus down to Manhattan and all of that. And so my identity was less tied up with Co-op City um, at all, but also with the Bronx in general. Um, uh, whereas, you know, that may not, that was not the case for everybody. That said, the, the other piece of that that I want to mention is that, you know, initially when people moved to Co-op City, wherever they were coming from, they saw it in some ways as this like safe space that was in some ways separate from the rest of the Bronx. In the, set, in the 60s and 70s, you know, crime still is pretty low in co-ops, very low compared to a lot of the surrounding areas, especially compared to the West and South Bronx, where a lot of residents had come from. And so this sense of being a place apart, I mean, it's not quite like Riverdale as far as that goes, but there was a little bit more of that sense of being a space apart. Um, as co-op city, first of all, like over time, I think that that has been less of an issue. I think there's more of a sense of integration. And I think I mentioned this very briefly, the mall Bay Plaza coming in is also part of that. Like people come into Co-op City, um, not just to, like visit their aunt or whatever, but also to go shopping. And that's increased the sense of connection between Co-op City and the rest of the Bronx. Mm -hmm. um, well, that seems a, a, a good place to conclude. And thank you for being so generous with your time and also inviting further questions for those. I think some people have, have personal connections. Um, yes, I'd love go to. Back to their own experience mm -hmm. or, or, or relatives and and have either memories to share or questions to ask. So um, so I guess the, that conversation will continue. But you've been really a spectacular guide oh, to you. both the uh, kind of you know personal experience of growing up there as well as the kind of intellectual framing of these ideas which does show to us so clearly that this was an exceptional place in its aspirations mm -hmm. um, and in its success but not but um, but success is always a complicated um, sort of uh, argument about mm -hmm. about how we succeed uh, but um, I certainly invite people to buy the book and read the book so that you can really get a lot of the richness of what Anne-Marie uh, 
captures for us and also the academic framing that's so clear in the opening chapters um, that marry this personal history with a broad view of American history and of the kind of periodization in the 20th century of how we approach issues like um, urban renewal um, and the um, ever present problem of affordable housing. So, Emory, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thanks everybody else. Um, if you join us in uh, October, on October 18th, uh, for something completely different, we have uh, a talk on uh, Art Deco architecture in New York. There'll be some Bronx um, examples shown, uh, but a, a, a book that is a collection of photographs by Andrew Garn and an introduction by Eric Nash, um, and then other topics that we move on to in the fall on urban archaeology and um, and cities and inequality. So a little bit of a, a, a spectrum of a sampler of, of many topics, all New York, all urban, and thanks for joining us tonight. So thank you again, Anne-Marie, and bye, everybody. See you next time. Bye. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation and thanks to all of the, the great questions from the audience. Thanks. It's been a pleasure.